Good evening. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, welcome to this special Art in Bloom virtual program, How to Create a Sustainable Native Landscape with Rusty Schmidt Landscape Ecologist. The Heckscher Museum of Art is pleased to present this program as part of 2023 Art in Bloom and in celebration of Earth Day. For Art in Bloom this year, our four garden club partners created 12 stunning floral designs inspired by artwork on view in the museum, which were on display last weekend. This annual event allows us to draw connections between art and nature, a connection which we look forward to continuing during tonight's program. I'm Caitlin Sher, Development Manager at the museum, and I will be your host. Uh, please note that if you'd like to turn on closed captioning, click the CC button on your screen and those will pop up for you. Joining me on screen very shortly is our speaker um, this evening, Rusty Schmidt. Rusty is a landscape ecologist at Nelson, Pope, and Voorhees LLC in Melville, New York, and is an adjunct professor in the, uh, excuse me, the horticulture department at Farmingdale State College. He designs and constructs alternative methods for managing stormwater runoff and has created hundreds of designs for habitat restorations, rain gardens, and sustainable landscaping ranging in size from small backyards to large multi-acre size campuses and parks throughout the nation. Rusty is a co-author of three books <laughs> on plant selections for stormwater runoff um, management and uh, a homeowner guide to rain gardens. At the end of the presentation, Rusty will be responding to some of your questions, and I know that some people have a few questions about their own gardens. Um, so please type your questions into the Q&A box on your screen or the chat box at any time, and we will be sure to try to answer those. Without any further ado, I'll now hand the program over to our featured speaker and allow him to share his screen. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think you also need to allow me to do the video if you wanna see my face. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There, there we go. We go. So um, uh, uh, my name is Rusty Schmidt. I'm a landscape ecologist um, and I do have a Minnesota accent. So um, you'll have to get used to it, I think. Um, and I'm actually speaking to you from Mexico, believe it or not. So this is the actual jungle behind me uh, from, my, uh, from my room. And uh, it's been a, a fun uh, week. I've been uh, I came down here for a vacation, and but this was Zoom, not a problem. I can absolutely help you out. So, okay, so I'm gonna move on to my share my screen. Um, make sure I hope everyone can see this. Um, okay, so um, uh, what I have here is. Uh, we're gonna just talk about native plants, why they're important for our, our wildlife as well as the environment. And then I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of uh, interesting designs that are using only native plants so that you can see that you could do this for your own property as well. Um, except for it's not moving here. That is weird. Um, one second. Oh, there we go. Okay. I was just on the wrong spot. Okay. Uh, why natives? Most people think that we're choosing natives because of the birds and the bees and the butterflies, and that is true, but I want to make sure that you understand that there's more to it than that. Um, and we'll get into the bees and the butterflies in a little bit, but I want to explain some of these other things first. Um, the, the first one that I want to say is our plants that were here, um, were here first, and they're used to our uh, wet springs, our wet summers, our cold winters, and our dry um, uh, 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 summers, hot, dry summers. And um, what was, and I'm gonna go back one, what was interesting along the North Shore as we are mostly in the North Shore, I live in Northport, so I, I understand this one, is that uh, we have a dominance of a coastal forest oak forest, which is uh, tulip trees, black and red oak, beech, black birch, and red maples. And then the understory is a lot of dogwoods um, and uh, laurels and things like that with some sweet gums and pin oaks. Uh, and, uh, and so we have, a and, and that was what was uh, originally here along Long Island, along the North Shore. And if you go to Comset State Park, you can kind of see what it was originally. 
And then, but there's also a couple other uh, plant communities that are very prevalent on Long Island. One is this area in Na that which covered a good chunk of Nassau County. It was a 50 square mile uh, Hempstead Plains. It's the furthest Eastern Plain uh, Prairie in the United States. The problem is, is that it's been totally plant uh, built up with uh, homes and there's only 13 acres left uh, over by the um, uh, Nassau uh, Community College. Then you can kind of see that as you're going into Suffolk County, it was an oak brushlands. Uh, and so you could, um, and, and then as it goes further east, it turns into the Pine Barrens. This is all that's really left of the original forests uh, and forest types or plant communities on Long Island, whether it's along the shore. Um, and you'll notice that most of them are associated with um, uh, parks that have been protected. The other reason, so uh, ha choosing plants that are here can withstand our, our climate a lot better. But then the other piece that I want to explain is our native plants have much uh, stronger and deeper roots than most of the non-native plants. And so most people know about turf grass, lawn grass, has roots that are only a couple inches deep. Well, our native plants, and this is, uh, this is a native grass, uh, it's actually uh, uh, river oats, and it actually uh, has roots. I broke the roots at 12, at 12 inches, and they actually go down about four feet. Um, and a lot of, and why this is important is that all plants, and this is a nice little diagram, you can see the K Kentucky bluegrass on the far left, and you can see a, a bunch of our native plants across the screen. But why this is important is that um, all plants, whether it's your tomato plants, your, your, your um, African uh, violet in the window, or, you know, your herbs in the window, or, um, you know, the grasses or trees or shrubs or perennials that are throughout the world, um, they all slough off a third of their roots annually and stop growing those roots. And they put down new roots looking for new nutrients and new water, it helps them grow. And the old root um, uh, uh, breaks down, decays and, and creates a hole in the soil. Why this is important is that you can think of them as reverse straws. When the rains fall and they land on uh, the bluegrass that, uh, or lawn grass that was only a couple inches deep, only a quarter of an inch of that one of a one inch rain event actually soaks in the ground and the rest runs off the landscape, even in our sandy conditions here on Long Island. The most of our native plants um, have roots that go multiple feet deep. So for instance, this is purple coneflower right there in the center. And underneath purple coneflowers, the roots go down six feet. Um, this is a uh, big blue stem and little blue stem put down roots that are six to eight feet deep. Um, and they're still not even the biggest ones. Like uh, the far left one here, right beside the Kentucky bluegrass is lead plant, Amorpha canescens. Um, if you've been to the High Line in June, you've seen this plant uh, in New York City. It's got silvery leaves, beautiful purple flowers, kind of looks like a bush, but it puts down roots that are 15 feet deep. And so what that does is when the rains come and they find these uh, uh, plant these plant holes um, in the soil from the roots, the water soaks through those roots and goes deep into the soil column, replenishing the water back into our groundwater much better than any other than most of our other plants. And uh, as it's going through that you have healthy soils that are created with those plant roots. And so those healthy soils have mycorrhizae, bacteria, fungi, things like that. They break down those nutrients and, uh, and release them for the plants to take up. So it's a symbiotic relationship. And so then that water that gets into the groundwater is pretty darn clean. And in fact, within two to three feet underneath the soil, the water is drinkably clean getting back into our groundwater. And if you don't quite believe me, this was a, um, a demonstration that was at the um, uh, Washington DC at the Botanical Gardens. Um, we had, uh, I was there for spring break with my daughter and uh, a number of years ago. And you can see these plants have roots that go 
um, anywhere from six to 15 feet, and you can see some of them are tied up. Um, and these are plants that you can find right here on Long Island. So these two right here are our little blue stem, common grass along, the, uh, along our shorelines, and they go down about six feet. Um, we have here um, uh, some flowers as well. We have some, uh, so this is a native um, uh, sunflower and it's tied up and it's probably goes to about seven, eight feet. Um, and so a lot of these plants that you see here, almost all of them, you can find right here on Long Island. So what do you think is the biggest crop in the US? Any, any, so say it to yourself, I'll give you another second. If you said corn, you would have been close. Uh, it's not. All the, all the major crops, if you add up all the things like corn and wheat and soybeans and blueberries and strawberries and add it all up in acreage, it actually doesn't equal the amount of lawn grass that is here in the U.S. Lawn grass is a crop. We water it, we fertilize it, we take care of it. But actually nothing eats it and um, it is uh, the biggest crop in the US and the only thing it's good for is picnics and you know soccer games and football games um, and uh, you know areas for kids to play but the only thing that eats it are geese Canada geese and so it usually just attracts unwanted uh, uh, animals to our area and it's a lot of work um, and so what I tend to do is ask when I get a new client is what part of your lawn is it only walked on to mow the grass? Is there an opportunity to change that? And so that's, that's my question I want you to think about. A little more information about lawn grass. Uh, we have converted 62,500 square miles, uh, about 40 million acres, um, about eight times the size of New Jersey in the U.S. to uh, this lawn grass. And there's no native, even though it says Kentucky bluegrass, it's not really native. And we still are converting about two million acres every year, about the size of Yellowstone National Park into lawn grass across the U.S. And so today's suburbia, um, the homeowner that your lawns, your landscapes have very little biodiversity. Um, most of the plants are not native to Long Island that are on your property. In fact, it's usually about 5% or less of the plants on your property are typically, uh, are, are typically native. And it's usually a tree or two. Um, it's usually not any of the flowers and grasses. And, uh, and new science articles are suggesting um, that the lack of biodiversity in the landscape is contributing to some of our pandemics and other health concerns to humans. And so what I, my challenge to you and to everyone is to think about how to maybe redesign your landscape so that becomes more healthy, more functional, um, and, uh, and then and it per, per, you know, produces a lot better opportunities for people. So this is a typical um, uh, suburban area. Um, with houses and, and, you know, small houses and garages and, and whatever. But I want you to think about where is the opportunities to change landscape. And if we all did this, and I'm going to push the button here in one second, watch as the picture changes in front of your eyes. These are all the locations that we could change our landscape, putting in plants along the property boundaries in the front yards and really still allowing lawn grasses to have that space for kids to play or, or um, have that look, but really have an opportunity to really change the landscape. Why this is important. Um, it, uh, insects are the main reason. Insects are the largest plant or animal group of, uh, that transfers energy from that's captured by the sun by, in plants and converts it into their bodies. And then they are then eaten by other things and it goes up the chain. So uh, we actually depend a lot on insects. Most people think about the bees and the butterflies, but it's all those other insects as well. So for instance, 96% <clears throat> of our birds uh, that uh, you have in your backyards rear their young on insects. In fact, they need to eat a lot of insects to grow their uh, broods of birds. 
And uh, they bring about one uh, caterpillar every three minutes or about 6,000 caterpillars per one brood of bird. Um, so so if, if the chickadees in your backyard are, are nesting, they eat about 6,000 insects, mainly caterpillars early in the spring, and they have a second uh, brood later in the summer and they come back and do it all over again. And now it's not as many caterpillars as it is all the other insects that are uh, available as, as the summer progresses. And the next piece to this is 90% of our insects need to have a specific plant sometime in their life cycle to develop. And that's considered a host plant. So on the right, you can see uh, the monarch caterpillar uh, eating on a uh, milkweed. And most people know that, um, that the host plant for monarch caterpillars are milkweed. So if you don't have milkweeds, you don't really have the opportunity to grow monarch caterpillars. And in fact, um, uh, and, and then those don't turn into monarch butterflies. And so what we're, uh, the monarchs have hit the endangered species list, not so much on the East Coast, but the West Coast, their milkweed populations, and more importantly, their fall um, uh, 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 plant sources for energy are dwindling in numbers. The one on the left is uh, black swallowtail. It's one of the most, it's the largest and probably coolest uh, butterflies that we have on Long Island. And, uh, and they need um, uh, golden Alexanders um, or uh, they might also eat your dill or, or cilantro in your garden um, to, to grow. So I told you that a lot of these caterpillars get eaten by birds. Um, they have different mechanisms to protect themselves. Some of them, like the monarch caterpillar, eats milkweed that's poisonous and makes themselves poisonous, and hence the need, the reason why they're bright orange to let everyone know, don't eat me. But there's other plant, there's other insects that do the hiding thing. So the one on the left is a liatris caterpillar. It's on a liatris flower. It actually takes bits of the flower and attaches it to its back and uh, and hides on the plant. The one on the upper right is um, a, a juniper or arborvitae caterpillar. And uh, that one is eat, likes to eat arborvitae and it looks like an, uh, the leaves of an ar arborvitae plant. The one in the bottom right is actually on a laurel leaf. That's a laurel caterpillar. Um, it is, um, and the white stripe down its back kind of gives it away right there. And the caterpillar is all the way around the outside. And it's hiding very, very well. If you don't hide, the next thing that you gotta do is have lots and lots of yourselves. So the other, one, other option is uh, there's a reason why inchworms come out of the oak trees in high abundance because they uh, need to have a lot of them to survive the onslaught of birds. So um, every time we plant a non-native uh, plant, an alien plant, a plant that's not from here, this region, hasn't grown up and uh, through the millennia and developed an association with our insects. And so they do not have uh, the ability to have insects grow on them. And so they're, wherever their home place is, is what the plant, that's the, that's the insects that grow on those plants. And so um, you've probably heard of uh, uh, lanternfly, spotted lanternfly being an issue. Well, the host plant for spotted lanternfly is um, the, um, uh, shoot, it's, it was just on the, Elianthus, I'm trying to think of a common name now. Oh, uh, Tree of Heaven. And uh, the Tree of Heaven is, was brought over to the US to grow. So not only did we prob make a problem of bringing in an invasive species, a plant that is not from here and is pushing out our native plants, but then uh, we have now brought over its uh, bugs that are associated with it, the spotted lanternfly, which doesn't just eat uh, uh, the plant that we wanna get rid of, the, um, the tree of heaven, but it's also starting to eat our grapes. And uh, you know what kind of a uh, issue we have with our wineries out east. We have shown, we've, uh, Cornell University have shown across the US that we've lost about 35 times 
less caterpillar biomass and that is indicator that our bird populations are down somewhere around uh, 25 to 35 percent depending on the type of habitat they're in. And so you may see some common guys like the chickadee here but um, you're we're losing out on a number of 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 our native birds and so um, and it's just because they don't have the insects to eat. So what are if you have uh, uh, the ability to plant one tree in your yard, look at some of these uh, powerhouses that produce a lot of uh, caterpillars that are associated with the trees. Number one is an oak. If you can do nothing else but plant an oak tree in your yard, you're already helping the environment. There's that many more, there's 534 different kinds of caterpillars that grow on oak trees. Black cherry, similar, 456. Willows, birch, popular, popples. Uh, you can see that the whole list is there of what are some of the more important species that are gonna have a better impact. And you'll notice that there's a few um, there's at least one shrub on here, the blueberry as well. Some of our perennials, the one that has the most bang for its buck is the goldenrods. Um, they do not cause hay fever. That's a wives tale. Um, they are stunning in the fall um, with their gold flowers. Um, but what's more important to not just the caterpillars that, that live off of them, the other big piece for goldenrods is they have a high nectar source late in the fall. So those monarch caterpillars or monarch butterflies drink the nectar out of these goldenrods, have enough energy to fly all the way to Mexico. So um, the monarchs have a, are migratory. It takes a few generations in one year to get up to the north and it takes one generation to get to the south. So it's a multi-generation uh, migration. And if you would like some reference books to, to learn a little bit more, this information that I'm telling you about with the, with the insects and plants are from Bringing Nature Home. It's a really nice read. He's ha uh, Doug Talame is, a, if you ever get a chance to hear him speak, do it. Um, and then the other piece to um, this is he's got a couple other books. So there's a good opportunity to look into options for this, uh, for learning a little bit more. Um, the book on the right, Heather Holmes, good friend of mine from um, uh, Minnesota, um, writes about the East Coast and writes about what plants bring in what kind of pollinators. And so you can actually use this book to look up uh, the plant, you know, what plants go into, the, you know, what plant, what are the plants that, uh, or what are the insects that plant uses, or if you want a specific insect, what plants you should be growing. Uh, for those specific insects. So it's a really good read. She has two more books, one about bees and one about wasps as well. So uh, just to give you a few of the host plants, the Luna moth, beautiful, beautiful moth. Um, if you've ever seen one in life, it is uh, absolutely stunning. Um, they uh, need walnuts and uh, hickories to, to grow up on. Painted ladies need yarrows and pearl everlastings. Painted ladies are probably the most uh, common butterfly on Long Island. The buckeye butterfly is one of my favorites. It needs plantains and toad flax, um, the native snapdragons. Um, and it's, it's my, one of my favorites. It's actually a stunning, stunning uh, butterfly and uh, maybe the ugliest caterpillar, but one of my favorite uh, uh, butterflies. Uh, the hackberry uh, butterfly needs Hackberry trees, it's right in its name. Um, one of my favorites is uh, the little azure butterflies. They're all about the size of your pinky. They're not very big um, and they need New Jersey tea uh, to grow on. But we can't forget about the bees. Um, the, bee, you, you, uh, the bees are just as important to everything else. And there's a lot of cool bees, in fact, the ones in the middle are not actually wasps. They look like them, but they're not. They're bald-faced bees. And um, you can see that there's, uh, these are, um, that these plants are all bringing in tons of bees. And, um, and, they, and the bees are the workhorses to make fruit and vegetables. If you don't have bees, we don't get the chance to pollinate and get, um, and get the fruits and veg that's coming from these plants. 
some of our bees uh, live in the ground, um, like uh, this mining bee on the bottom right, or most of our, our um, um, uh, bumblebees. When at this time of year, if you're starting to see some big holes that are too big for ants, uh, these are bee nests. And uh, the queens are opening them up uh, and uh, coming back out and starting whole new nests. They're not really colonies, they're individual bees in each, in each hole, um, uh, but they kind of live near each other. There's a bunch of cavity nesting bees as well. So um, there's the carpenter bee in the upper, in the upper one, but then uh, there's also mason bees and a number of others. If you decide to do a mason bee box or, a, or, or uh, do a nest box for bees, Make sure that you understand that you do need to clean it out because um, you can cause uh, uh, issues with colony collapse uh, disease. In nature, they don't need the boxes. Where they find is mostly in either old logs or better yet, most of our uh, perennial plants, they, they hollow out the stem and uh, grow inside the stem from one, year, one season uh, for, through the winter to the next season. So um, moving on a little bit, um, some of, and you might wanna take a picture of this. Um, here are some nurseries that you can buy from. Uh, Long Island Natives in Eastport. Um, it's a little ways away, but there's a website there you can uh, look into. Um, and, or Warner's Nursery. Uh, the lady that works with you is called Vicky Bustamante. Um, and, uh, or Decker's Nursery in East Northport. Um, has uh, uh, plants for sale. So all three of them have opportunities um, to, to get plants, a uh, little larger quantities. And what I would do is uh, see what's on their website, email your order to them, contact them ahead of time. What they'll do is they'll pull the order for you. And so when you show up, you have an opportunity to pick up your plants. It's a lot more efficient. You're gonna stay in budget and you really get what you wanna get. Um, it's my, my strong suggestion. However, uh, Limpy, the Long Island Native Plant Initiative, um, has a spring and fall plant sale coming up. Um, and you can go on their website at limpy.org and see their um, plants that they have. Uh, Limpy's plants are truly Long Island uh, plants. We collect the seed, grow the plants up, and sell uh, the plants. Um, the second piece to that is that uh, they have longer hours, so you can make arrangements co contacting them. You can come to the plant sales, or you can order plants throughout the entire season to see what's available. Just go on to their website. Um, and then there's a few organizations that you might want to talk, uh, look at. Uh, Rewild is in the Port Washington Peninsula. Uh, Garvey's Point Museum has a native plant sale. Both are up for sale, uh, doing plant sales right now. And again, you might want to take a picture of this um, or um, watch the uh, recording afterwards. And then, the, but the last one is as you uh, more than likely are closer to Northport and, um, and uh, in, in that and uh, over to uh, Huntington, definitely look for the Facebook page of the Northport Native Garden Initiative or NNGI. Um, you can go on, they have a plant sale that is on, uh, up for sale right now, and you can get a lot more um, uh, plants from them as well. And then there's a few other great Facebook pages like the Long Island Native Garden Group um, that, can, uh, that you can get more information from them as well. Um, uh, so the rest of the way is, I'm gonna just show you kind of cool pictures as we go. So this is a native garden uh, that is taking, um, uh, protecting all the water um, uh, from this neighborhood, but then also um, it's, a, it's a beautiful area and, uh, and this is more of a prairie style garden. You don't have to go big. This is a little one. This is one that um, I helped with uh, for my daughter when she was in the third grade. She's 27 now, so it's a long time ago. But what we did is um, we actually uh, removed this grass and, re and did the replanting. So um, uh, we didn't actually even kill the grass. We just covered it up with mulch. Um, and uh, once the mulch was in place, a couple inches thick, um, we planted it. 
Um, and of course it rains when you're working with kids, I don't know why. Um, and then you uh, plant uh, what we were doing. We didn't even have a plan because the kids weren't gonna follow it anyway. So we had them take out their rulers and they each got a six pack of plants. They moved the mulch aside, they stabbed the ground, opened up the hole, planted it, the plant green side up, uh, and then took their ruler and did it again a little further away. Uh, this is what it looked like one year later. So all these plants that you see here are, uh, except for one, is actually native to Long Island. Uh, so these purple ones here in the, in the bottom right are um, bur wild bergamot. The dark purple ones in the middle are um, hyssop, uh, what, anise hyssop. The yellow ones to the left are yellow coneflowers. The long leafed uh, ones that look like purple coneflowers are actually a narrow leafed purple coneflower. In the back, we have um, some marsh milkweed, and we have Joe pie weed, and then we have some liatris, um, which is blazing stars, a little tall one in the back, and the tall one in the dark far back right is ironweed. So uh, the, the two tall yellow ones are the only ones that are not native to Long Island, and those are uh, yellow coneflower and a native sunflower. You do not need to go with all perennials. It does not have to look like a riot of color. Um, you can go with just shrubs. This is a native garden that we planted with this two kinds of shrubs. Um, uh, we put red twig dogwoods in the middle and fragrant low grow sumac around the outside. And this is what it looked like five years later. The, the, ma the maintenance man, Joe, Joe the maintenance man is doing a great job because what we told him is if it's not a a shrub, you kill it, and he's doing a great job. This is a yard in Nassau County and um, uh, over in uh, East Meadow. And uh, this is what it looked like after just a couple of years. You can see that uh, uh, this, this whole area is all native plants on both sides of the walkway going up to the front house. This is at the Clark Botanical Gardens. This is a native garden and a rain garden. And uh, you can see how thick this one is as well. We've let, we chose plants that are a little bit bigger because we had the opportunity. So that last one, you can see that most of the plants are very short. This one, we let, we went with a different style plant, a little bit taller. That's that same garden from the other side. Uh, this one is uh, just a little garden right up by the road. Uh, purple cone flowers, black eyed Susans, uh, ironweed, bergamot, or um, wild monarda, uh, wild bergamot, uh, some native grasses. So, this is a little blue stem. And you can see that they're all, those are the things that are blooming. There's a whole bunch of other things that bloom later in the season, and things that bloomed earlier in the season are done. This one's all in shade. I just happened to take the picture at the wrong time of year when there's not a lot blooming. Um, uh, this, there's a two week window where there's only these uh, white flowers blooming, which are yarrow. Everything else was uh, bloomed a little earlier and will be blooming shortly. So it was just a bad luck of my timing, but you can see that you can do this entire thing in shade as well. And I love adding ferns to gardens and or gra uh, native grasses and sedges so that you get a uh, difference in textures and different colors of green as well. This is uh, in that same yard, but in the front with all um, perennial flowers. And this is uh, one near a parking lot in Kansas City. So this one's not near us, but all the plants that you see can be grown right here. And uh, this is a fall uh, shrub garden. Um, you've already read the sign. Um, this is at a target. Um, and the reason why you've read the sign is all the plants, uh, kind of like a cemetery, all the plants are in rows and so that they point at the sign. Uh, we did this on purpose. This is all native plants. This is right after planting. Now the plants are so thick you can't uh, see the mulch, but um, you do continue, you, when you look at it, you, you can't help yourself but go up the 
uh, up the rows and see the sign. Wouldn't you like to sit out in, uh, outside of this car wash? This is all uh, native sunflower, uh, wild bergamot, and anise hyssop. Brings in lots of uh, butterflies that you can uh, observe and watch as you're waiting for your car to get washed. Um, this gentleman, um, his, uh, this is a, all, we did this garden here right in front of us first. And then after he, we did this, he wanted to do the rest of his yard. So we did the far left. And we left a patch in the middle, that's the same yard, uh, for him to sit out with his um, lawn chair, read a book under the shade tree. This is, uh, this uh, garden is now much older. It's about 10 years late, uh, 10 years later. And you can sit under the shade of that tree. He mows the grass in about 10 minutes. This gentleman, um, his uh, grandkids came to the house all the time. So we left a large piece of grass for them to play soccer and lacrosse in the backyard. But you can see the edges are all native plants. He went out to weed and that's the only weed he found while he was out. So he spends more time drinking his adult beverage, in this case, a Diet Coke, and smiling than he does spending time in the garden. So he actually, he, there's no additives, there's no, no watering, there's no fertilizers, there's no pesticides. Um, and he, he just goes out to weed every once in a while and he does it um, twice a year and that's it. And he usually is done in about 15 minutes. This is a very large uh, set of, of um, native gardens. This picture was taken in November when everything's starting to die back, um, but you can see that it's uh, quite robust and thick. This is uh, the, the building in the, in the background is a adult daycare. The building that I'm standing next to is an assisted living facility. And so the, the residents of both sit out and watch the, the butterflies and the birds, and they have a lot more to look at than a big long grass that people kept mowing and they, uh, they spend time walking through it or hanging out with it. It's really a cool place. This one is in Riverhead. This is a garden, all natives, uh, that is in their parking lot. This one is in East Meadow, or sorry, not East Meadow. This one's in uh, Mutton Town um, and a, a, a long, it's a rain garden, but also very native. Um, and we built this one in 2015. So this is what it looks like during the summer and fall. Same year. Um, lawn grass has its place. Um, we don't try to take it all away. Um, there are areas that you want to walk or that you want to traverse or have an area to play with the kids, as we said, or in this case, accentuate the native gardens. There's a few non-native plants in here, like these hostas in this peony and these annual, um, uh, yep, and these annuals, uh, but, you, but most of the rest of the plants are native. And don't you wanna walk down this path and go around the corner and see what else is there? It does invite you in. Another set of, of beautiful plants in front of a not so in, inexpensive house. Blazing stars and coneflowers and bergamot. Or this one can be small just by the mailbox. Doesn't have to go crazy. Uh, cardinal flowers and yellow coneflowers. And what I have uh, when somebody has a little more property, I tend to try to get them to think about having the garden close to the house instead of out, you know, so that they could have put this meadow in, in back by the fence line. It's actually better to have it close to the deck where you can actually enjoy the activity that comes to the, to the garden. And you can see that it's uh, blooming at different times of the year. Grasses are accents. Um, uh, we have uh, ground covers like this is wild geranium in the foreground that fills in the space and uh, bloomed early in the season. 
and now is moving into the iron weeds and the blazing stars and the black eyed Susans. You can have it a little bit more, more organized or you can put it a, or organized and cr cr creating a, uh, a screening between one condo and the next. Or you have a hillside that's hard to mow. Why not plant it in things that you don't have to mow? So in this case, a, uh, a, a low juniper, a creeping juniper, a few shrubs and trees, flowers around the edges and uh, provide access, but not a place where you have to uh, go up and down a steep hillside to mow. This is actually at a, um, a uh, warehouse and so this is what the, the all the employees park in and under they park under the trees and get shade and uh, as they're walking into the facility and you can make put things in groupings or clusters and really keep it organized or you can keep it completely random or something in between These big Joe Pye weed uh, flowers that get eight feet tall may not be a really good idea in front of the picture window, but for this lady who sits on the porch, this was a great opportunity to hide the, the hot tub from uh, the neighbor. <laughs> so um, I want to explain a little bit of design. I like designing in groupings or masses with drifts of plants. Um, um, and that I'm really trying to uh, make a sustainable garden where the vegetation is suited to the conditions that you have with water and, and um, soil and sun, and that it becomes an integral role, uh, role in, the, in the biogeography of your, uh, uh, and, and the nutrient cycle of hydrology and nitrogen and carbons. And so when you're, choosing plants, make sure that you choose the right light level. More people choose shady plants and put in sun or full sun plants because they're beautiful but have a shady site. They kill more plants by, by light level than anything else. So make sure you understand the light levels that you have and choose appropriately. There are beautiful plants in, in all light level conditions. Um, full sun is, you would think, is something that gets full sun most of the day or is in full sun from noon until the end of the day on the west side of the house. Part sun is usually um, that early morning uh, through midday, or um, you have uh, something in that five to seven hour range of sun throughout the day. Part shade is uh, where you're got, you have just two to four hours of sun and shade is no sun. So then, uh, or, or mottled sun, you know, it's coming through the leaves. So the next thing to check is your soil conditions. You can actually get your, your soils tested by CCE. So Suffolk County CCE will actually um, uh, test your soils. You need about two cups of soil, take it from a variety of spots on your yard or a variety of spots within a garden that you wanna uh, put in, put it in a plastic uh, Ziploc bag. Um, look online and you'll get their little form and send it in with a check for like, excuse me, $25 or so and off you go. Uh, understand your moisture. Is it a really dry site or a really wet site or something in between? And is it on a slope that might dry out faster um, uh, than other spots? And then finally, think about the size and shape of your garden that it fits the house. A little patch that, you know, is only a... Um, um, a few feet and you have a big yard doesn't look as great as a little larger garden. So think about the size and shape and access. So what I like to do is think about gardens that really have, um, a, uh, have just a few plants, but in an organized pattern. So the two on the left has a lot of plants with just, uh, or uh, sorry, um, large groupings of plants but only a few species, two, three, four, five, six species, where the one on the right, uh, the two on the right, is usually a little more like eight to 10 species, but they have different patches throughout the garden. 
And so um, who I learned from is a gentleman named Kate Odolf. He designed the, um, the High Line in New York City and a whole bunch of other places, but that's the closest big one that most people know about. This is actually the design of the High Line. And you can see that he has a repeating pattern of plants uh, throughout his gardens. They look like the random, but they keep coming back over and over again. So as you're walking, you really enjoy uh, this section. So some of his gardens that I wanted to show you um, are that he's done. The, the, these two are in the Midwest. Um, this, the second one really, it looks like a Monet, right? Absolutely stunning. Um, similar colors in a softer background um, and in big groups. This is the High Line uh, in New York City. And he has designed um, uh, the planting scheme to have that, that good feel and repeating patterns of plants. Remember that plant I told you about that had the silver leaves and the purple flowers and it has 15 foot deep roots? There it is right there on the left. That's the lead plant. Most of the plants, not all on the high line are native. There's a few that are not, but when I design, what I'm looking for also is a cue of care. So not only do I plant in groupings, but the other piece that I like to do is, is have a, a, a edge of a sidewalk or a little lawn or um, put in the pink flamingo or the bird bath, something that gives that idea that it's not a weed patch, but there's a cue of, of care, meaning that their plants are spaced correctly, um, putting them together and showing uh, different pieces like edges, like retaining walls, making it look like it's a deliberate garden. Or maybe it's a split rail fence or a little arbor. Or in this case, uh, uh, I showed you this uh, earlier. This is the garden that was, I took a picture of the wrong time, all in shade. Um, a park bench or a, in this case, a little water feature of a stone bird bath um, uh, uh, makes it look like it's deliberate. So this is right after planting, right uh, within a year, it was uh, fully developed. Split rail fence doesn't have to go all the way around. You can just put it in the corners and uh, make it, and so you can show that it's a deliberate site. Or a little railing. That's that same garden. And you can see that it's near a lake, but it's um, all native plants. Everything that you see here are things that you can grow here. And, uh, and then uh, that split rail fence really helps delineate what is supposed to be mowed and what's not, and that it's officially a garden. Um, these are gardens uh, here um, that uh, are planted differently. So this is adding screening. So you have your your tree in the upper left, you have your trees that provide screening above the fence, but we need to plant some things like skip laurels or mountain laurels or um, um, uh, you know, some other evergreen bay bayberries or things underneath the trees so that they can uh, get layers of screening like the one in the bottom left. Layers of screening showing uh, blocking off down the hill. Or on the right, this is in LA. Um, it's the plant, the trees were planted uh, uh, in a grouping, so it makes a shaded walkway. And lawn grass can be something else. This is a no mow turf grass. So this is a grass that only gets uh, three inches to four inches tall. You do not need to mow it, except for when the seed heads come out in June. And this isn't a great opportunity to. Um, have a lawn grass without having the extra need of care. Or you can put it in shrubs, like this uh, right is fragrant low growth sumac, or the left is a creeping juniper. Or you can go with a short uh, ornamental grass. So this area is um, uh, prairie drop seed. 
stunning uh, short. Uh, it's only about uh, nine to 12 inches tall grass that kind of makes fountains of, of grass. We've seen this picture already, but you can see it's a little bit older. We've seen, oh, and then the last thing I wanna hit and then I'm gonna stop is if you go to the website on the bottom right, there's a website called um, from the North Hempstead ny.gov backslash NP for native plant. Um, you, they have a number of gardens to use as a template. Um, I designed these a few years ago and they're reusing them. You can see that uh, how many plants you need um, for a garden that is, um, uh, I think it says somewhere like 100 square feet. And you can kind of see what kind of numbers of plants and how many. And then on the right, you can see how the garden changes in color from month to month to month. So this one's a native garden in uh, all perennials. This is a, a part shade. Uh, uh, all native um, to shade garden in perennials. And then we have some shrub gardens in sun and shade. So that's it. Hey, that's pretty good timing. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Rusty. Um, I know this was very informative. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Um, now we'll take a, a couple minutes to answer some questions. So I see some already coming through. Um, so I think you covered this a little bit at the end of your presentation, um, but our first question is, what type of lawn grass seed is best to use on Long Island? So do you want to speak? I, to I have one for you. Seed? There is. So um, if you're going to stick to lawn and uh, a standard lawn, there is a Long Island sunshade seed mix that is um, kind of my favorite to go to. It, um, the company uh, that you buy the, the seed from is used to be called All Pro. Now it's site one. It's in Lindenhurst. Um, they will ship it to you, or you can call and go and pick it up, um, and they will help you get the right amount for the area that you need. But I'm going to tell you, if you want a lawn grass, that's probably the the right way to go for Long Island. Right. Um, our next question is: How can you kill weeds in a lawn without using herbicides? Is there anything organic that you'd recommend? Um, so there is an organic um, corn gluten that you need to put down in this month, uh, you know, last week and then the next week or two. Um, it's organic, it's corn, called corn gluten and it actually prevents seeds from germinating. So if you have a new lawn, you're stopping the lawn grass as well. But if you don't have, if you have an old lawn, that's a good way to kind of stop a bunch of things coming up. Other than that, um, the best way, unfortunately, is to pull them. Um, you can hire the kid across the street <laughs> or you can, um, but it's usually, unfortunately, the best way is still to pull. Um, and um, uh, there's not very many good organic methods out there. You can use, um, there are some things that are, that unfortunately kill everything. So you're not killing just the, the weeds. So um, there are some things that have like um, uh, alcohol and uh, um, uh, so you can find them online. It's a mixture that you can do, but instead of spraying it or spreading it willy nilly, you're gonna want to just paintbrush the bad plants and you will be, and otherwise if you try to spray it, you'll also kill the lawn grass. There's not very good organic solutions to that. Our next question, um, what is the range of costs for those of us with brown thumbs um, to have a 40 by 10 sunny and same size shady patches designed and planted by someone knows who knows their stuff? Okay, um, so 40 by 10 is pretty big. It's 400 square feet and you have two of them. So that's 800 square feet. So, um, uh, so somebody that knows what they're doing the plants are the expensive part. Um, they, the, uh, if you want it all in perennials, which I would not recommend, you're, you need like 400 plants. And if you want instant gratification, those plants are 12 to $20 a piece. It gets really expensive really quick. If you don't mind the instant gratification, if you can plant plugs, it, now 400 plants is about, 
um, you know, uh, 200, $300 for the plants and you have a, a letter, a better cost savings. Okay, so now that we've said that, oh no, wait, it would be, yeah, that's about right. So now with that said, the designer, depending on who you hire, um, can charge anywhere from 500 bucks to $5,000, depending on what you're trying, um, who, who you're hiring and, and what you're trying to ask them to do. Um, the knowledgeable people, um, I have, uh, I would send a note to the Long Island Native Plant Initiative, uh, Limpy, and ask them if they have a, a list of designers that know what they're doing. That's going to be your best bet to get a list of, of folks. Um, there are a few of us out there that do this every day. Um, don't trust anyone that just says, oh yeah, I've done it lots of times. Really get them to uh, make sure that they understand what they're doing and that you really want native plants, not cultivated species or non-native plants, and, uh, and 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 make sure you get the right get the right group of you know a good designer. There's a lot of us out there. You just gotta. There we're kind of hiding. Um, our next question: um, Do you take the timing of when flowers bloom into consideration when choosing what to plant? Absolutely. So I wanna plant things that start blooming in uh, April. So for instance, uh, golden Alexanders, uh, which are uh, Zizia aurea, they're already blooming in my garden and I already have bees coming to my golden Alexanders in my garden uh, last week. So uh, they're already blooming. So I look for things that bloom early in the spring uh, for the bees that are coming out of hibernation. Um, and then I'm looking for things that start blooming in May and June, like geraniums and things like that, or um, for the shade or in the sun, I, I try to use uh, Baptisia. Uh, the indigos, the blue false indigo or the white indigo or yellow indigo. Um, and so I have things that bloom in the early year. And then I try to have things that bloom in June and July. So then those are things like butterfly milkweeds, one of my favorites. It's orange, it's bright and colorful, brings in a ton of bees and butterflies, and it's the host plant to the monarch. Um, um, and then after that, then, you know, I'm looking for things that bloom in August through November. That's actually the easiest time. There's more plants that bloom in August, September, and October than any other time period in, uh, in Long Island. And so I'm always looking for that wide range that blooms all the way from April to November and a few shrubs that bloom in the middle of the winter or have berries in the winter that provide uh, opportunities. And I'm really thinking about shrubs, grasses and flowers, and even ground covers. I try to do the whole gamut. Great. Well, I think that's our last question. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you, Rusty, again, for sharing your expertise um, and uh, your time with us. Uh, of course, we love learning about native plants, and I hope everyone will be inspired to go out and do some planting maybe this weekend during Earth Day. Um, thank you for everyone uh, for attending. And as a reminder, if you miss seeing Art and Bloom in the galleries in person this year, you can see photos of the arrangements and the de designer's inspiration statements on hexure.org. Um, so please take a look. And uh, thank you again. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Rusty. Have a good night. Thank you. Take care.